Hey guys, Arthur here, and I know what you're thinking. What the hell happened? Well, you see, over here, I have a wall. It's fresh, it's flat, it's better and brighter than the old little corner that we used to sit in. So I decided to get what's in the old corner, me and myself at the desk, and post it over to this new wall. And now the desk has lots more features, such as all the original content that it had before. Hang about. So ports, they exist. Many of their common developers really want people to enjoy experiences that they've created in the past, or when big studios don't have any ideas and just want that dollar. Most of the time, the idea of a port isn't really too appealing. Like, if it's just the exact same game, then people start to wonder, what the hell is the point? But, throw in the word deluxe in there, and BAM, you'll have copies selling by the million. Definitive Edition, DX, Director's Cut, all new funky mode, call it what you will, but to me, they're always going to be known as the deluxe treatment. These types of games apparently aren't just your everyday run of the mill ports. They can actually include some stuff that may warrant your time and your money. Deluxe games really aren't remakes as such, and they're not quite remasters either. They're just kind of weird in between of everything. It's very odd. In recent years, Nintendo has given a heavy bunch of its Wii U titles the deluxe treatment, so it's only right that I waste the next 20 minutes of both of our times overanalyzing their worth. I know I said that we've seen a lot in recent times. But it's really not a solely recent occurrence. In fact, Nintendo's been a heavy accuser of deluxing things for quite some time now, with one example being way back in 1999 with the release of Super Mario Bros. Deluxe for the Game Boy. Contrary to recent games that have been deluxe, this game is actually pretty deluxe. The game features the old classic Super Mario Bros. with our good friend Sick Mario, but quite a haul of changes. For example, you can actually save the game. Impossible! You are given a new world map, Peach and Toad now have talking animations to begin with five lives, and the water and lava portion of the ground levels are now animated. Now, admittedly, that doesn't sound too fantastic until you see all the bonuses that they shoved into the cartridge. Nintendo went wild with the bonuses. They added a challenge mode, a super players mode, you versus boo, the toy box, a fortune teller, and even a calendar. Finally, I can mark my weekly realisation sessions that this is pointless. Yeah, there's a calendar, and it exists, and while it may seem like a must-have, I think I could live without it. There are also a ton of images and art to gaze upon, and if you're a fan of redundancy, you could have owned a Game Boy camera and print them out so you could own a receipt with Mario's face on it. The previously mentioned Super Players Mode is one of my favourites in the cart, as it is a version of Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels, which in my opinion is a very nice move from Nintendo to include Pain. You vs Boo is another mentioned mode, which acts very similarly to Time Trials and Mario Kart, but instead you race against the Boo. The Boo pulls a 3DS from us and changes its look every time you sneeze, changing the difficulty as this happens. Challenge mode is another little mode that includes going on an Easter egg hunt, except that eggs are little spotty dinosaur eggs and there's also red coins. All of these additions are great, but none of them will trump the fact that Nintendo made the right choice and changed the first sentence of Toe's dialogue to have a comma after you. Thank God. Super Mario Bros. Deluxe doesn't feel too different that it's a brand new game, but it certainly needs a deluxe because, oh my, it's deluxe. In the same year, well, in Europe, Link's Awakening was released to the public. Link's Awakening was another Game Boy game, but was initially released in 1993 with these horrifying green graphics. The deluxe version in 1999 made the game look less like a toilet and gave it a brand new coat of paint on the Game Boy Color. Along with the brand new colours, it also featured a brand new dungeon known as the Colour Dungeon that could only be accessed in this version, and rewarded the player with either red or blue tunic, which provided the player either a better attack or better defence respectively. It also added the feature that allowed players to take photos after visiting one of the camera shops in the game. Twelve photos were able to be taken and they could be viewed in said shop, or if you still owned redundancy, then you could once again print out said photos with the Game Boy printer. Now, in my humble rejected opinion, this really is a deluxe version of Link's Awakening. For some reason, during the 2000s, Nintendo really didn't like making new Mario games for handhelds anymore. So, just decided to re-release all of the main series Mario games. Well, excluding the first one which had already been deluxe, as Super Mario Bros. Deluxe as previously mentioned. These games were Super Mario Bros. 2, Super Mario Bros. 3, World, and World 2 Yoshi's Island. How bored can you get? The Super Mario Bros. Advance series, or also known as the Mario games that I don't really care about. Now, now, hold your pitchforks, I know a lot of people love these games and basically lived off them in their childhood. But, I wasn't one of those people. It is possible that I once did own one of them on the Game Boy Advance, but if so, I don't remember it. I was more of a Sonic Advanced man. So, seeing as my opinion is now irrelevant, feel free to tune me out as white noise for the next few statements. These are pretty bad advanced games. Some people could disagree and say that they don't belong in this video because they are remakes, but actually they are re-releases. 
They had just ports over from the SNES game Super Mario All-Stars, or a port of the actual SNES games Super Mario World and Yoshi's Island. So technically, these are re-releases slash ports, but seeing as they have a fancy name, I'm going to class them as deluxe games. In conclusion, they're bad deluxe games. Not bad games, just bad deluxe games. Okay, my relevant opinion is over, so feel free to unmute me as we go take a look at another company's attempt at a deluxe game. Back in the good old year of 2001, Sega decided to stop making garbage and become solely a third party manufacturer. So, because of this decision to stop working on the recent failure of the console the Dreamcast, they had decided that they wanted to deluxe some of their gems onto the big console, such as the Nintendo Lunchbox. Two examples of games that got this transfer are the two Sonic Adventure games. Maybe they should have stayed in the grave. Sonic Adventure 2 was initially swapped over onto the GameCube only six mere months after the original release of it on the Dreamcast. With the interesting new subtitle of Battle. Don't ask me. Out of all the subtitles in the world, Sega went with this. Sure. In all my studies, I couldn't find any reason why they added Battle to it, and there was no reason not to just leave it as Sonic Adventure 2. But anyhow, this game features more detailed textures, updated body counts, and adds multiplayer options including new abilities, upgrades, and exclusive characters. They also decided to remove this nightmare with a dark chow in multiplayer mode. The reason? Big the cat. While it could be argued that it is just a port, in my opinion it does class under the deluxe treatment, but with just a new fancy name. In 2003, Sonic Adventure made its way over to the GameCube as well, five whole years after its original debut on the Dreamcast. But this one also has a new title, Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut. Now I know what you're thinking, why DX and Director's Cut? What is the point? Now trust me when I say this because I've spent millions of hours and weeks and days and years and centuries studying historical documents, artifacts, articles, and I've come to the conclusion that it really is just a waste of time thinking about it and they probably just thought it sounded cool. In my humble and trustworthy opinion, I feel more so than Sonic Adventure 2 Battle that this is truly a DX game, or if you want, a director's cut of the game. The jump from the Dreamcast does wonders for lots of the game and really makes a difference, and it's very evident in not only the textures, but also the models for Sonic and Friends. Sonic and Knowledge looks so much better than its Dreamcast counterpart, albeit still quite odd. There are some instances where the Dreamcast looks a little better in my opinion, but on the whole the GameCube adds a ton of improvements graphically. Not only that, but the menu doesn't look like a sofa. One thing that is noticeable is the game made the jump to 60fps, although it really isn't too stable and does dip on occasion. But overall, it's an excellent DX game and is a pretty good example of an excellent port. So Mario Kart 8 it exists. Mario Kart 9 it doesn't. Nobody really played Mario Kart 8. Millions of people bought the Switch. Do you see what I'm getting at? During the 2017 Nintendo Switch presentation of 2017, Nintendo decided to unveil the fact that there wasn't a new Mario Kart on the Switch, but instead there'll be a port of an old Mario Kart that was on the Wii U. This game is the first of a long line of deluxe games for the Switch, which... Which you could blame on Mario Kart 8 Deluxe for selling so well. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe's biggest features that give it the worth of having the name Deluxe were the additions of all the previous DLC, the addition of Inklings, Bowser Jr, King Boo, Dry Bones, and if you thought that the roster couldn't get any better, you were right because they had a Golden Mario as well. Now, previous DLC, that's a pretty common trend with some deluxe games as a way of marketing itself. The game is the deluxe version because it includes all the content that you've already paid for. But, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe doesn't just do this, it also fixes one of the biggest flaws in the original Mario Kart 8. It fixes battle mode. Battle mode used to be pretty terrible and this was not a good thing for the already doomed Wii U game. But the Switch version made a pretty stellar experience. New and old game modes, new courses, and even new items such as the return of the feather and the boo. In my opinion, Mario Kart Deluxe is the definitive way to play Mario Kart. It gets so much right for fans new and old. Oh, and did I mention, you can carry two items now. Sure. It adds a surfboard. Now again, I can see what you're thinking. But there are at least two more Deluxe games for the Switch. These are of course Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition and Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. Now, you see, the reason I didn't cover these games is because I spent my money on Robonauts for Switch, so I'm completely out of pocket. Please don't judge me. Now I don't want to gloss over these games completely, so I decided to rummage through my bin and I found an expert on these games. Please welcome Just That Finley 64.
Ah, uh, well, if it isn't the crafty master himself. You know, it's been a long time since you trapped me in here after I did that write-in for your SNES Classic episode. <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen. Right, okay then, I assume you need me to help you with something from this big book you gave me last time. Back to Chunk 1 episode plans. We don't need that one anymore. Animal Crossing themed Christmas special 2019. Well, that obviously didn't happen. What exactly am I looking for here? Cash grabs. Again. Oh, there it is. Make a Crafty Master saying epic compilation. Estimated length 55 minutes. No. Oh, wait, no, I'm on 500. No, I'm on 500. Sorry, my bad. Uh, where's 600? Uh, talk about Hyrule Warriors and Xenoblade Definitive Editions. Well, that's not too hard. Took them long enough. So, Hyrule Warriors. The original game was released in 2014 on the Wii U and was essentially a Dynasty Warriors game with Zelda visual sound and gameplay mixed in. Then in 2016, Hyrule Warriors Legends was released on 3DS and with it came a lot of new content and some extra DLC. Then in 2018, Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition was released on the Switch. The Definitive Edition takes all the content from the Wii U version and all the content from the 3DS version, including all the DLC, and combines it into one massive Switch game. Seriously, the amount of content in this game is ridiculous. A quick stroll over to howlongtobeat.com and to complete everything, it would take me about the same amount of time as it will take Arthur to finish the 602. So, what exactly are you going to be doing for these 400 hours? Well, as previously stated, this is basically a Zelda version of a Dynasty Warriors game, in which you defeat waves of enemies, capture keeps, and eliminate enemy captains in order to complete the mission objectives. It features all the most iconic Zelda characters, enemies, locations, items, and even bosses. But what I particularly like about Hyrule Warriors is how they incorporate iconic gameplay elements from the Zelda games into the core Dynasty Warriors gameplay. Using items to uncover secrets, cutting grass and smashing pots to collect goodies, and collecting fairies to aid you in battle are all really nice additions and shows the amount of care that was put into this game. But the level of polish and detail is not only evident in the gameplay, but in all aspects of the game. The adventure mode maps are themed around all previous Zelda games. You can use the materials you receive from enemies to upgrade your characters. You can unlock heart containers by completing certain objectives with certain characters. I mean, wow! Everything about the game is so well made. It perfectly captures what makes Zelda so iconic and translates it over to a completely different genre. And I haven't even talked about the soundtrack yet. It's like if you took all your favourite Zelda soundtracks and combined it with a bit of this, some of these, and oh, would you look at that. Yeah, some people really don't like this rock style of Zelda music as they see it as a bit too over the top. But what I'd say to them is, guys, this is a Warriors game, everything's over the top. So in conclusion, Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition is an excellent game and definitely deserves the definitive in its title. If this looks like your kind of game, I would definitely recommend picking it up. Hey, does anybody know what a Xenoblade is? Yeah, me neither. The original Xenoblade Chronicles was released in 2010 on the Wii to critical acclaim and is considered one of the best Wii games of all time. Unfortunately, not a lot of people cared about it originally as most of the core Wii audience were too busy punching each other in the face on Wii Sports. However, those that did play it were blown away by its engaging combat, fun characters, excellent story and massive open world. The game got a few sequels, including the one that no one cares about, the 3D remake that I totally didn't forget about until writing the script, the one that everyone bought because it was one of the Switch's holiday titles, and the prequel to the sequel. But none of these are quite as highly regarded as the first game, so Nintendo decided to just make a definitive edition of the original that didn't look like pure garbage. So releasing in May of 2020. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition was the original Xenoblade, but now in HD! And wow does this game look nice. I mean Shulk actually looks like a human being now instead of a blob of Play-Doh. The textures, models and especially lighting have all been improved significantly, resulting in one very nice looking game. It's not only the graphics that have been remade, but the entirety of the soundtrack has been too. Each song from the original has been given a modern day version, and if I'm being honest, I don't know which I prefer. Both are incredible and easily some of the best video game music of all time. As for the gameplay, it's basically the same as it's always been, and everything I've played so far has been really enjoyable. But the big new thing that everyone is talking about is the brand new epilogue. And when I say everyone, I mean probably about five people. I haven't played it myself because I haven't beaten the main game yet, but from what I've heard, it was okay. Nothing crazy that every RPG fan should play, but just pretty good. 
But in conclusion, I would definitely recommend picking up this definitive edition, especially if you've never played the original. Well then, thank you for that information, Dump, but I'm afraid now your time is up. So, I guess I'll see you when I see you. Hang on, what? It was fun, but now it's time for us to move on. So mediocrity, it stinks, right? Well, imagine being a game with two descriptive words that mean nothing to anyone that's stuck on a failing system. Like seriously, what the hell is a you? New Super Mario Bros. U was a game in the new Super Mario Bros. series, that's for sure. Was it good? Yeah. Was it needed? No. This game suffered the unfortunate fate of being released on the Wii U. It's a tragedy. But not only that, it was released in the exact same year as another new Super Mario Bros. game that was released for the more popular 3DS. Who the hell names this? Anyway, newsflash, it didn't sell. So fast forward to January 2019, and Nintendo once again got bored to re-release new Super Q, bundled with another disappointment, Luigi Y, and decided to add another adjective that we all know and love, Deluxe, making this game new Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe with one hell of a logo. My lord, that's one irrelevant title. As I previously mentioned, the game includes the two Wii U titles, New Super U and New Super Luigi Y. And that is it for the gameplay. It only really functions as a way for Switch owners who didn't own Disappointments to get the game a go. Does it do this well? Yeah, I'd be pretty worried for the company if it managed to fail at porting a game. But the big question a lot of people ask about these ports is, is there any point in me getting the game if I already owned a Wii U? All Nintendo added to this game was Toadette, the Super Crown, Peachette, ungodly creations by the fanbase, and a ridiculous method to select Blue Toad that nobody in their right mind would think of without looking up. But honestly, it's an okay game. It functions. But should it just function? I really, really feel it really should have added a lot more than just Peachette to give it the Deluxe name. And so it could provide some oomph to the returning players. So yeah, that was Deluxe games, I guess. And it's unfortunate nowadays that most of the time it's barking off your wallet. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for game preservation, but still, charging £50 for a port, that is nothing really new. I mean, there are some instances like Mario Kart Deluxe where the games really do work, and they're very, very good. And they improve upon the overall experience of the game, which is fantastic. But as I said at the beginning, nowadays they just use the rescue average game from disappointment and bring them over to their vastly superior younger brother that tons of people own. It's insane. So now there really aren't that many games left to port over to the system. I mean, there's still 3D World, of course, Kirby, Star Fox. Not you.